Welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. A little bit of history now. Let's, let's just go back a little bit to 1975 on the 5th of July. If you look very closely at uh, the world of tennis, you might notice that there's not so many uh, black tennis champions. Well, except, you know, the Williams sisters, Serena and Venice. Uh, but, you know, that's in the female category. If you look at, of course, well, um, the new kid on the block now, uh, Coco Golf, um, I think. Uh, but if you look at the, the male tennis category, there's not very many of them, you know, from, uh, you know, the African-American um, 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 category. Um, but there's just one of them. And of course, it was on this day that he made history in 1975 to be the first black American, uh, African rather, uh, winner of uh, Wimbledon um, in 1975. This happened many, many, many years ago. And over time, that has not changed. I've looked to see if there's going to be any other one um, over time, but not, not even once. On 5th of July, Arthur Ashe uh, defeated the heavily favored Jimmy Connors to become the first black man to ever win uh, Wimbledon. It, it is, of course, still the most coveted championship in tennis. He began playing tennis as a boy in his hometown in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, two years um, after winning a tennis championship, uh, a scholarship to UCLA, he was taken on the wing of tennis star Pancho Gonzalez, who recognized the young player's potential. In 1968, he became the first black man to, U to win the U.S. Open. And two years later, he captured the Australian Open for his second Grand Slam title. Over the next seven years, he won his share of tournaments, but no, may no more majors. Um, until, of course, in 1975, when he was 31 years old, and he eventually won the Wimbledon uh, title. Uh, furthermore, um, um, he, of course, his best finishes at, at Wimbledon had been losses in the semifinals in 1968 and 1969, and that was before <coughs> 1975 happened. He eventually retired from competitive tennis in 1980 after suffering a heart attack, and um, over time won 51 tournaments. In retirement, he wrote a three-volume book, A Hard Road to Glory, which was first published in 1988 and, of course, detailed the struggle of black athletes in America. In 1983, this is maybe the sad part of his old story. In 1983, he, um, after a double bypass surgery, he was infected with HIV um, after a blood transfusion. And that's the story of Arthur Ashe, uh, the first um, African-American to win Wimbledon in 1975. Mm. Interesting story about Arthur. See, um, I love dark horses, right? People who nobody ever looked at to think they would do, they would do great. People who, people, people who others looked down on, you know, and Arthur Ashe was one of such, even though he had, first of all, he was no um, stranger to breaking color barriers. He had won um, other tournaments that others hadn't because you know he was one of the first black men black tennis players to win those awards and also when he came to this Wimbledon because he was about 31 years old at the time you know people said oh you are way past your prime there are other younger players who are going to go in there and thrash you so it was very surprising when Arthur won that game because he became the first black man to win Wimbledon. Now, that racket you see him holding now sits at the National Museum of American History. He donated that museum to them, you know, just gave it to uh, the National Museum of American History um, to say, you know, just given this part of his, you know, just the honor to share that with the world. And talking about that AIDS um, story, I, I found that very, very sad. He had a blood transfusion mm. and, but, we know that there's lots of advancements in medicine, of course. Your blood will be tested to make sure that you're clear um, if you have to donate to someone. But he had that blood transfusion, was infected with AIDS. Then he became a champion, speaking out about AIDS, you know, sensitization, and then later passed in 1993. Well, great story there about Arthur Ashe. He basically broke, broke records and just gave the black name a reputable yeah, still, story and history. It's still sad, you know, and this is what I mentioned earlier. It's still sad that, you know, since 1975, there's still not been any, you know, reasonably very successful male tennis, uh, black uh, uh, tennis player. Mm. Um, I can't think of any that has, you know, won, uh, the, you know, either the US Open, you know, Wimbledon, any of them. You know, I guess Open. that's why Arthur is, well, is you know, celebrated globally yeah, for, for breaking such a, such a history. Yeah, but still why? <laughs> I just can't figure it out. Why? <laughs> I mean, aside the, 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 you know, the Williams sisters, 
um, who, of course, are phenomenal. Um, and I saw um, Andy Murray even had to, you know, defend them a couple of days ago when he was being uh, interviewed. And, you know, he, so the, the interviewer had said, oh, you know, you, you know, the, I can't remember what the question was, but he had to remind them that, you know, the Williams sisters had broken those, you know, records, you know, long ago before any male uh, counterpart and all that. But there still should have been one male black tennis player. Mm. The world so is waiting for you. Sorry. I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> so they said about Arthur. <laughs> Let's go now to um, the year 1946. Now, on this day in history, a French designer um, designed what is now known as the bikinis. Now, this story, I have personal issues with this story because we know about how white people will take something that has been existing in the black race and then say they invented it, they discovered it, they, mm. you know, when you find out there's really nothing new under the sun, you, you know, dig into history and you find pictures of ancient Egyptians rocking bikinis, you mm. know, with inscriptions of <clears throat> hieroglyphics on their wall, you know, so, but it is said that this French designer introduced the bikini. I would rather use the word reintroduced because like I said, you find pictures of Asian history, women um, wearing bikinis. So he basically, according to what the story says, because of the aftermath of the Second World War, there was you know, rationing of material. And he said, okay, let him um, make do with what he could. And he designed these two-piece bikini suits. The, you know, there was quite an acceptance of it in France, you know, people accepted it. But in other parts of the world, you know, people frowned at it and said, oh, you know, you're just sexualizing the woman. It's very immodest and, you know, just lots of criticism. But people then began to change views as time went on to say, oh, this is emancipation of women. You know, this is liberation for women and, and their bodies. And now it's globally accepted. I mean, bikinis is one of the most popular sports outfits or sports clothing ever. And research shows that 85% of bikinis don't even enter water. You know, women just wear yeah, bikinis to look shoots. good, you yeah. know, for photo shoots. And, you know, just bask under the sun and have a nice time at the beach. So, yes, um, on this day in history, um, 5th of July, 1946, um, French designer Lewis Reed actually reintroduced the bikini. Yeah, um, good thing seeing those pictures, you know, and seeing what it looked like in the 40s. Um, what the bikinis actually look like, you know, because now they're just ropes. Um, <laughs> so they're just ropes. <laughs> then when they used to, oh my, you mean thongs? Then when they used to, they're just ropes now. <laughs> they're not ropes. <laughs> then when they used to complain, because I saw a short video clip, you know, of people saying, "Oh, that show is showing too much," you know, disgusting and some of that. That's in 1946, uh, but eventually it was accepted. Uh, over time, we've gotten to a place where it's just ropes. You know, you just have a rope, um, you know, between the. the <laughs> it's called a thong. <laughs> <laughs> it's still just ropes, you know, and. Um, you know, we, we've gotten to accept, you know, that nudity is a part of our world. Nobody was born with clothes. Um, and oh so it, should, it shouldn't, you know, be such an issue if a person, you know, decides to. And I, I, I have absolutely no, no issue with it. So what do you have um, to say to people who criticize women who wear bikinis to beaches? And, you know, women say, oh, am I supposed to wear an agbada to the beach? You know, people do yeah, this. But that's true. What are you supposed to What else are you meant to wear? That It's beach wear. Um, it might have different names, thongs, bikinis, whatever you want to call them, but it's, it's beach wear. You, what, how else are you meant to go to the beach? But you know, we still have that culture in Nigeria, especially when the woman is married with kids. People then body shame and say, oh, you're married, oh, you have kids, you shouldn't be dressed that way. Do you think that's being hypocritical? It, well, because they um, will look at girls like that and find them attractive. So why then do they criticize? Yeah, I think there's, there's still, we still have that cultural and religious um, you know, hypocrisy hanging all over you know, us because a lot of the things that we criticize, we do them behind closed doors. A lot of the things that we you know, frown out, uh, at in public, you know, we glorify behind closed doors. So, um, and it's really, it really depends on if you care about what any other person thinks you know, and what your you know, partner, the person you're married to, thinks. That's the only person that matters, not any other person's opinion on the outside. So if you have a wife that decides to want, she wants to wear a bikini and take pictures on the, on the outside, you don't have any problems with it. Any other person's opinion doesn't matter. Mm. That's their own personal problem. They should do what they want and you know do what they choose. Mm. Mm. So That's yeah, you know, we, we're celebrating bikinis, celebrating the new age bikinis. Looking forward to what it looks like in the next twenty years when we move away from ropes to strings. So nothing. To maybe. <laughs> well, the end is near. Well, <laughs> let's take a break here, <laughs> and we'll be back to talk business. Do stay with us.